Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask a Career Coach, a Work Ready program. Work Ready is a program that is running from December of last year to December of this year, and it's designed to help people who are affected by COVID find jobs or to improve the work situation. And by that, I mean get a promotion, get a raise, or create a sustainable career path through wise career planning. And we're doing that in three ways. The first is we're overcoming the digital divide by lending out laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots. So you get a computer and an internet connection. And we're doing that out of 20 library locations all over the county. All you have to do is go to our website, lacountylibrary.org backslash work hyphen ready, or just go to lacountylibrary.org and right in the middle of that page, you scroll a little bit down, there's the work ready link, click that. There's a very simple form for you to fill out and we'll sign you a laptop and you can come pick up a laptop. You can have that laptop for six weeks. The second way the work ready is helping you meet your goals is through events like this. We have live events for the six week sessions and each of those live events are about a different work related topic. Today we're talking about a bunch of topics, but usually we try to focus on cover letters, resumes, different career planning topics. Next week we have a program about veterans, which I'll tell you about at the end of this program. And the third way that WorkReady is helping you is the library is purchasing the latest and greatest books and ebooks about all sorts of work related topics from different kinds of exam prep to different jobs, the teleworking environment, anything you can think of about work, we have books on it. You can either put them on hold and go pick them up at your library, or you can go to Overdrive, which you go to our website and then you go to the in the middle of the screen, you can go to you read online. We have uh, Overdrive, which is our vendor we use for ebooks. You can go there and we have a special list for work ready. And so you can check out books without even leaving your chair, which I think is fantastic. So those are the three ways that work ready is helping you. And without further ado, let's get into today's program. Our presenter today is Liz Moeller. She's a frequent library presenter. And this is her third time actually doing a work ready program for us. And she's a career coach. And we're very happy to have her here today. Liz, if you could put your camera on, let's get this program underway. I am yeah. here and I am ready to answer all the career questions that come in. Can you guys all hear me now? And can you see me now? Let yes. us know in the chat if you can hear Liz. Yeah, give me a thumbs up in the chat. Oh my gosh, you know, it is definitely the COVID world that is challenging us. So I am so glad to be here. And if we have to run over for a few more minutes, we will not delay in making sure we do the best we can to answer any of your questions. So Anna, Sylvia and Oleg, let me know that you can hear me. Can you both hear me? Yes. Yes. Can yeah, you both yeah. see me okay? Yes, I can see you and hear you. Then we Perfect. are ready I to think go. We're, I think there's, we're good. There's Oleg. All right, let's get this so, show on the road. So let's do Where this. I have a slide for you here, Liz, so that you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, that's great. That's and then we'll beautiful. get into the ground rules for today's event and the topics that we'll be talking about. We'll be exactly. ready for your questions. Excellent. So I will introduce myself briefly because many of you might have heard my program that I did for the library a while ago. We did a resume program and I did my keynote, which is the world of work and the road to job search success. Although I'm not sure it's really a roadmap in the 2021 program. I've been career coaching for over 15 years. I have done a lot of programs at public libraries because I think that the people that show up to the public libraries are very, very smart. They're very resourceful. They're very creative in going to the places and the resources and the people that can support them the best. So I love teaching career development at libraries. I have a private practice where I help people in transition. I also teach at colleges and universities. I taught at the master's program at Pepperdine University, and I do a lot with UCLA, LMU, USC, because a lot of people in career transition are getting right out of college. Another area that I focus on is private practice, where clients come to me and they're at break point. Sometimes they're working, but they hate their job and they wanna leave. 
And sometimes they're working at a place that's really, really fun, but they hate their boss and they want to leave. And so we try to work together, my clients and myself, to get them on the, on the place that they want to be. So my tagline for Liz Moeller Consulting is that I help people realize their potential, visualize their goals, and actualize their dreams. So that's a little bit about me. I mean, I can go into some details. I'm from the Midwest, Madison, Wisconsin, and I am currently um, in traveling a little bit and I'm in Boston because my son will be graduating from Boston University. So I have a passion for helping the young graduates that are out there, but I also have a passion for helping anybody that's been laid off during COVID. I'm currently working with a lot of Marriott hotel executives that have been laid off to no fault of their own, they got a pink slip and maybe some of you on the call have experienced being laid off due to COVID. So I'm here to help you, whether you're a recent grad or whether you've been laid off or furloughed or whether you're just in career transition. So that's a little bit about me. And Oleg, why don't you go through the, I think you were gonna do some, some orientation rules. So go ahead and give them yes. today some, some things to start. Yes, so the way that this program is going to run is we're essentially going to be breaking it down into five sections and depends on how many questions we're going to have. We're going to take time for each section and try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, there are a few ground rules since this is a fairly large event. We have a quite, quite a few participants here at this moment. We have 55 participants in with us here. So that's a lot of people. If we all be in a room together, we could we could spend hours and hours and hours answering questions. Um, so the ground rules for our day today, questions should be on topic. So on, on the right hand of the side of the slide, you can see the different topics that we have and we'll take time for each. The questions should be brief. So try not to send us paragraphs because really what we want is the, the basic question so that Liz, Liz usually is able to talk, speak to many elements of each topic. And so she'll be happy to expound on your question, even if it is brief. Now, don't get too specific with your question. And the reason for that is there are a lot of people here and people might have similar questions. So if you get really specific to you, then it might not be helpful to the rest of our participants. And then as long as we are doing so many questions. Let's try to do one question per person per topic. And if we have more time after, we can spend some more time and answer other questions. So if everybody is okay with that, go ahead and let me know in the chat and then we will start. Sounds great. I know sometimes people are shy about asking career questions. I notice then this when I do workshops in the public, and then I also notice it on Zoom because it's kind of like some people show up and they just want to watch TV. But that's the beauty of having me here is that you can actually type your questions in the chat and we can get the conversation rolling. I, I always like to say there's kind of there's no one way to get a job. There's no one path, everybody's unique, just as there's no two jobs alike, there's no two people alike. So each of your career paths is going to be a little different. But if I can get you started and thinking about it, you know, hopefully my goal at the end of this conversation is that you'll walk away with one or two or three ideas to kind of shift the way you think about looking for work. And maybe you'll think about it a little differently because possibly the way you were taught to get a job when you were in high school or what your parents told you to do is a little different in 2021. So hopefully we'll get some questions about, you know, what is the world of work like post COVID as we get out of COVID? So we'll cover a little bit of that as well. So, so we just anybody... got our first question, yeah. And it's, uh, it's one that we have been, that we've covered so many times because it's so important. Um, for those out of the workplace, uh, who have been out of the workforce for a while, how best should we target the gaps in our resume and explain it in our cover letter? That's a great question. And I think what's interesting is not only do you have a gap in your resume because of COVID, but we all do. And not just the United States, but around the world, we're all gonna have this pandemic global gap where we're gonna look at what happened between March, 2020 in March 2021 or June 2021. So welcome to the world. You're not alone if you've got gaps in your resume. Some people have gaps in their resume because they took time off to take care of family 
or they took time off to raise kids or they took time off because they got fired or they got let go or for whatever reason, we're gonna have gaps. The best way to address those gaps is honesty and truthfulness. And you have to have a story. So explaining that you were working in retail or restaurants and the pandemic happened and you, you had to quit is absolutely understandable. But having a story, being able to explain that you took care of family, being able to explain what was going on, and maybe ask yourself, well, what was I busy doing? Did I pick up a hobby? Did I take an online class? If you can come back with a story to explain that gap, it absolutely should be written in the cover letter. And it can also be filled in on the resume. If you were taking care of family, put that in as a job, put that in as household responsibility or um, household manager or senior citizen care and go ahead and justify that on applications in resumes and in cover letters because you want people that are going to see those things to understand so that's one of my quick tips on dealing with the gaps in the resume so i think you covered this already uh, but how about the gap due to raising a family i mean how do you address that specifically this is another example that's really kind of fascinating because it's actually against the law for an employer to ask you, do you have children? Are you married? Those things are, are protected. So you don't actually have to answer those questions in an interview. However, when you get to an interview, if you can explain that you've been raising kids and that you took time out of the workplace to support a family member, as I said, I think honesty is the best policy. And then you can move forward with, you know, I have a very supportive um, family, so childcare won't be an issue going forward. I've made a conscious decision to come back to work. I'm very excited about coming back to work. My responsibilities at home are now resolved. And so I have 100% attention ready to focus to getting a new job. I'm excited about getting out of the house and returning to work, but be excited about it. Let people know why you want that job. I kind of call that the million dollar question, which is what, what, what exactly are you looking for? And then why should we hire you? Because if you've got a gap, because you've been raising a family or taking time off from work for whatever reason, maybe you thought you were gonna be called back to your old job and you waited and waited and waited because you thought that old job was gonna come back. As long as you have a story, as long as you can back it up with a reasoning, you're gonna be able to answer that question. What exactly are you looking for? and why you want to get back to work, and people will believe you. They will understand. All right, let me ask you just a very simple uh, sort of functional question. A lot of people are wondering about uh, what fonts to use the, uh, in order for the resumes to be acceptable to applicant tracking systems. Ah, the old ATS. And did you say fonts? Like which fonts? Yeah, like okay. fonts. Like yeah, exactly. Like yeah. Courier New or 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 Comic Sans. Comic Sans. Ex Comic Sans is actually a little bit more. I want to call it kindergarten style. Yeah, probably so, not the best one. Yeah, I'm still a fan of Times New Roman. I'm still a fan of Calibri, and I'm and I'm just a fan of keeping it clean and crisp. But know that your resume is actually your marketing piece. So if you're a graphic designer, if you're in, um, in technology, you may want to go ahead and, and use a font that's gonna be easily read and understood and is clear. And this is something I tell my clients, when you're sending a resume to somebody, you may wanna do what's called save as a PDF. Because when you save it as a PDF, those fonts, those bullets, those creative markings, the spacings, when you PDF it, it's like taking a photograph of it. And then I always recommend my clients when they're attaching a resume, make it easy for the recruiter, make it easy for the boss to put your name, resume, and then the job. So Liz Moeller's resume, UCLA, they know that that's the resume that I wrote for them. Because if you don't put your name on it and they print them and then they're looking at them or they're, they're forwarding an email, things can get really lost in translation. So you do want to make sure that when you are, if you can, if you can get out of COVID, if you can show up and hand deliver a resume, then you have the control of printing it, looking at it and making sure it looks wonderful and tight and crisp with the right fonts. But if you don't, 
make sure you do it as a PDF. And I also sometimes tell clients, you know, use the font that works on the page, but don't leave blank white spaces. In other words, you don't want your resume to be a page and a half. If it's a page and a half, try to fill in with hobbies or interests or a summary to make it two full pages, make it look complete. If you're a recent high school grad or a recent college grad with minimal work experience, or you've been at the same company, you might be able to fit it all on one page, but know that resumes are gonna be glanced at and it's to make them curious enough to call you in for the interview. Because the role of the resume isn't to get you the job. The role of the resume is to get you the interview. So we want the resume to look good enough and have a lot enough information to draw the person in to want to have that conversation further. And you mentioned filling in the spots to get it to, to if you need to have a, a two page resume. Um, so somebody had asked, is it okay to have a two page resume if you have a lot of experience related to the job that you're applying to? Absolutely, absolutely, because we want to give enough information that it triggers the curiosity. And so if you're very, very experienced in what you're doing, you want a lot of that information to go on the resume. So you can go online and you can Google different types of resumes, but there's basically three types of resumes. There's the old school chronological, and that's in reverse order. So the most recent job is at the top. And the chronological resume should really only go back about 10 years, because if you worked as a secretary 15, 20, 25 years ago, that skill set's probably a little obsolete with technology today. So nowadays we say maybe the last 10 years on the resume. And so if you've got a lot of powerful background and experience, you may need to go beyond a functional resume or beyond a chronological resume and use what's called a functional where you do highlights of qualifications and you put a summary and maybe some skill sets and maybe some, some specific information at the top. And then you can put more and more information that relates to your background and your, your experience to make it functional to fit the new job. Or you can do what's called a combination resume, which has highlights of qualifications, skills, experience, and then a, a list of, of where you used to work in a chronological order at the bottom. So sometimes you need to kind of Google for your industry and maybe even look at some resumes because a resume for graphic design is going to look very different than a resume for a professor, which is called a curriculum vitae. So you kind of want to make sure you're doing the resume to fit the job, make the resume look like something that's familiar to a recruiter or to a boss who's looking at lots and lots of resumes and looking for the same material. Yeah, great question. That's great. And actually, it relates to the question, a couple of other questions that came in. I'm going to do them both together because they're actually, it follows what you just, you were just talking about a CV. And so the one question is how many pages is too many for a resume? Um, and the other question is when do you need a CV and when do you need a resume? Now, the reason I ask them both together is because I know that a CV can be can be pages and it can be 10, 20 pages, depending on, on you, because you're putting all of your experience in education or whatever it is. So I'm going to leave, leave this to you. That's a huge question. Yes, <laughs> Oleg. And we did talk offline a little bit about not wanting to talk too much about resumes, because as I said, at the very, very beginning of this session, there's no two people alike and there's no two resumes alike. And if you print a beautiful resume and you show it to five people, guess what? You're going to get five different opinions from, I love it. It's pretty good. It's not that good. It's terrible. It's awful. And that's the scary part about trying to write a resume is you can't please all of the people all the time. But what you can do is you can take your resume and you can actually show it to a few people that are in the industry you want to get into and you can ask them for the feedback. Because in general, curriculum vitae for academia, that has all their publications. And I say professors research and a lot of information. I work in Los Angeles, so a lot of my clients are Hollywood types and their resumes look very, very different because sometimes they're lists of movies, commercials they've worked on, films they've done. It's like a laundry list. It's like an, an IMDB, which is the Internet Movie Database, which is just the stats of where they worked. Whereas different kinds of resumes, you really do sort of need to specify who the resume is going to. You might be the same person, 
but you're applying to three different jobs, you're going to want to change that resume to fit each job, which is confusing to people. But I tell them, how many jobs do you need? You just need one and maybe a few side hustle jobs. But if you rewrite the resume to fit the job, then what you're doing is you're, you're going in the back door. You're looking at the job description and maybe the job description asks if you've got management and, um, you know, computer skills and data entry, you look at the resume and you move data entry to the top and management to the top and you can rearrange those bullet points to customize the resume to fit the job. And then another job description might have three other topics that you haven't got on your resume at the top and you'd want to move those up to the top because the number one reason you're going to get hired is also the same reason you're going to get fired, which is the number one thing that the boss is looking for, which is also what you're looking for. And it's a really simple three letter word and you might want to write this down because it's all about the fit F I T. So if you can make your resume look like their job application, then you've got a really good fit. So putting it together, if they want someone with 10 years of research, you've got to show them 10 years of research. So that could be 10 pages. If they just want to know that you've got one year experience and that you can do this set of skills, then just put those set of skills on the resume and make it make it a good fit for them. Yeah. Sounds good. And I've got a couple of just very short ones compared compared to those. I think this will be it's like a yes or no questions here. So the third type of resume is a combination resume and that, that combines elements of both a chronological and a functional resume. Now, somebody asked a, a, a very good question, and that is if somebody has not has been out of the workforce for the last 10 years um, and you mentioned that a chronological resume takes the last 10 years of you know, of their work experience. So in that situation, would they go back further? How would they arrange, would they have a combination resume in that situation or just go straight functional and talk about skills? If you haven't worked, so if you haven't worked at all for the last 10 years, your chronological resume is gonna be a little tricky. So I would recommend functional. I would go with what are your skills? What is your experience? What is your knowledge? And go ahead and front load it with with what it is you're bringing to the table. Yeah, functional. Let's move, let's jump way ahead. Let's jump to career planning. And we're, we can also cover questions. I just wanna let the audience there know that we can cover questions about networking, interviews, and teleworking uh, also. But let's, we've got a few questions about career planning. So let's get to these now. Um, so we've had a couple of questions about, about age. So, Somebody wants to know here for 65 plus, what are the chances to get a job in this market? Um, it seems like like it might be tricky. It seems like there there, there are not many jobs, um, and they, you know, is somebody who's over the age of 50 still a desirable job prospect? <laughs> well, that is always a tough question because ageism is alive and well, and unfortunately, it's going to get you no matter where you are. If you're 18, 19, or 20, you're too young to get a job. If you're 50, 55, 65, 85, you're too old to get a job. If you're 30 or 40, you've got family and kids, and you're you know, a middle, middle level, middle age, you can't get a job. So the reality check is some places will hire you and some places won't. So one of the curious factors that I give my clients is you should be a little curious, and you can actually ask yourself, where do I see people like me working? And the, anybody who really wants to work can absolutely get out there and just, you know, walk around and talk to people. And rather than asking for a job, hey, I need a job. I haven't worked in 10 years. Who will hire me? I need a job. One of the big shifts I give my clients is to really start with kind of phase one, which is all about you. What exactly are you looking for? What's at the heart of the matter? What is it that you love to do? And who's out there in the world that needs your help? And who do you wanna help? Because if you're older, 55, 65, 75, you've got wisdom, you've got experience, you've got knowledge under your belt, you've raised a family, you've bought a house or lived a lifetime. So you have to kind of get creative with, Who's out there in the world that needs my help? 
who can I help? If I'm 55, I can help someone who's 65. If I'm 65, I can help them if they're 85. Or I'm 85 and I want to help the, the kindergartners. So the ageism is alive and well, but it needs to be addressed head on. Sometimes when I'm working with an older person, I tell them, make sure you're technologically savvy. Make sure you say that you're willing to learn. Make sure that you dress to impress and that you appear to be vivacious and, and not old. Try not to be the stereotype of who you are. If you're young, try not to be the stereotypical young person. Try to be professional. Try to, um, you know, wear a little less makeup or wear a little more makeup. Whatever it is, you've got to ask yourself, what's the look that I need to have in order to fit in and be the person that they're looking for? It's an interesting, interesting question whenever age comes up um, at our work ready programs, because working at the library, uh, it's oftentimes a second or third career for people. So the, uh, in the library, the age uh, tends to be older. So oftentimes, like I'm the young, I'm the younger, youngest person in the room or one of the youngest people in the room. So it's it's always interesting that there are places out there that that don't want the or, you know, don't prefer the experience of people who are you know, interested in doing the job. So it's, Absolutely. It, but it's strange, you know, it's, yeah. ageism is such a strange thing. Yeah, well, and, and I think Oleg, you kind of hit the nail on the head. If, if, and what we're seeing in 2021, and this is kind of a buzz term, it's, and I'm sure we're all aware of this, it's about diversity, equity, inclusion, and that we want a multicultural, multiple, you know, people that have different perspectives can actually work together and make a company better. So if they've hired all young people, they're missing out on some of that wisdom and maybe they need somebody like you. So you come in with a different perspective or different visions. You don't wanna work at a company where everybody's exactly like you because then they're not gonna be able to think outside the box. So use that as, as an advantage, make your uniqueness something that's of value to the employer. Yeah, if people take away anything. I think that's that phrase that you just said is is what people should take away. Yeah, it's your okay, uniqueness. If, if if you're the youngest one in the room, you bring youth and vitality. If you're the oldest one in the room, you bring maturity. If you're smack in the middle, you can bridge the gap. So uh, let your uniqueness be who you are. You can't change who you are. You can't change your age. You can't change your your sex. You can't change the color of your skin. You are who you are. And so find an employer who's going to value that in you. If you're, the, if you're the oldest person in the room, you bring age and vitality. Exactly, exactly. So let's move on to some more career planning questions. Um, do you think the job market is hot right now and easy to get hired now with COVID, even though people are now able to get vaccinated? You know what? I have been watching the news and career development and career coaching is something I'm incredibly passionate about. And there are some serious work shortages all across the United States and the world because of the disruption that we've had. People are now um, starting to reevaluate what they're doing in life. And so I'm seeing a lot of mobility and a lot of movement and I'm seeing a lot of job openings. For example, in hospitality, even though lots and lots of hotels closed and restaurants closed, now they're starting to open up and they're desperate to hire staff. And the fact that I've been traveling, I've seen this all over the country where I go into restaurants and it's not that they're at capacity with their chairs, it's that they don't have enough waitresses, they don't have enough dishwashers, they don't have a lot enough people in the service world to take care of things. There's also high level executives that possibly took a break and maybe even did an early retirement. And so companies that had to lay people off are now scrambling as they try to rebuild the structure that they had. So I'm I'm seeing the economy get a little getting a little better. I'm very optimistic. I feel like we've all been through a lot and some of us are a little nervous about getting out there and starting work. So if you can overcome being nervous and be confident that you can help a company, that you can help a restaurant, pick your favorite restaurant, start part time, maybe even start by volunteering just to get sort of out of the house and back into the world of work because I think there are jobs out there, absolutely. So actually, I think I have the answer to this question, um, but I think we both have answers to this question because this question relates to the program we had last week. 
Um, so the question is, just like college, students have access to career planning. Is there a place to go if not in college? The answer is yes. <laughs> yes. And, so, and I, you can talk a little bit about the uh, AJCC, and I yes. can add my own comments to that. So last week we had a program about the America's Job Centers of California. Um, they're, they're part of our Department of Workforce, Aging and Development, WEDEX, and they are a wonderful wraparound resource for adults and, and emerging adults. So anybody, I think over 18, and they even have teen programs who are looking for a job. They offer career coaching. They offer you know job placement. They offer training. They offer all sorts of really wonderful opportunities. And uh, so the program we had last week was specifically about the AJCCs. And we're going to have that on YouTube very soon, probably tomorrow. Um, so I'll if I'll post that in our in the email that I sent following up this program tomorrow. Um, but I can also send put a link in the chat right now um, to the AJCCs. And so people, if uh, the person who asked this question wants to take a look at that, I I do very highly recommend it. And now turning it over to Liz. I, and I highly recommend them as well. I used to work for the one stop career centers. I also used to work for the Jewish vocational services. I also used to work for the EDD, the unemployment insurance and experience unlimited. And so I can tell you that the world of work is so huge and there are so many different areas that you can explore to get support. Alumni associations, a lot of times people forget that even if they went to college 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you could still reconnect through the alumni association at whatever school or university you attended. And you can also use the career services that are at the public library that are online. There's some wonderful career um, services on LinkedIn. You can take some LinkedIn learning. There's online YouTube videos, how to write a resume on YouTube, how to prep for an interview on YouTube. And those are free. Those are free and open to the public. There's also a lot of like social service groups. Um, I always tell people, you know, check in with your local chamber of commerce, check in with your local um, church or synagogue, check in with your neighborhood association, because a lot of times those local places can actually be really beneficial. So we've got a combination of starting small where you are and what's in your community and think about someone at a church or someone, you know, that's well connected, you know, your hairdresser might have some information because they're talking with a lot of different people. And even just being out in the community with like a chamber of commerce or a business group or a rotary or, uh, you know, any other sort of nonprofit that you could start as a volunteer and just work and work and get some experience, get your foot in the door and then use that as an opportunity to springboard to something else. But I'm a big fan of, of all the government resources that are out there. It does take a little bit of Googling, a little bit of research, but that's 2021. We're in the age of information where knowledge is power. So Googling, you know, jobs in blank and then fill in the blank and put the name of your city, the name of your community and kind of tighten it up because there's some great resources out there to help you. Actually, that relates to a question that we that another question that we had every every one of these questions seems to be related and they're related to careers. So, Good. so the question is, uh, how do you have advice for somebody who wants to transition to an interesting new career, say, cybersecurity, but is not sure what specific job or role would be suitable for them? Ooh, that's a great question. So another thing that I recommend is teaching everybody the number 1 most effective way to get a job. And if there's anybody on this call that's coached with me or had a one on one session with me, you'll know that one of my keynotes is networking. Networking is one letter away from not working. So <clears throat> when you're thinking about making a career change and you want to go into cybersecurity or you want to do something like that, number one is you can Google it and you can research it and you can study up on it and figure out what exactly does someone in cybersecurity do. And then maybe even join a Facebook group or join a LinkedIn group or just talk to somebody who is in that business. You can read articles about them. You can go to the library and read books about them. But certainly when you're pivoting, 
One thing that I tell my clients is that if you can choose a category that's familiar, you can go into it in a familiar way. So if you want to get into cybersecurity, but maybe your background is in accounting, and maybe you did accounting at a law firm and you want to get into cybersecurity. If you're accounting at a law firm, you could look into accounting at a cybersecurity firm. Because then you're still doing accounting, but you've left the law world and you've gone into cybersecurity. Or you can stick with the legal stuff and maybe get a job doing something legal for a cyber cybersecurity company and transition that way because you're taking what we call your transferable skills. So if I've got, you know, maybe safety and maybe I did um, security, maybe I was a security guard, but I want to get into cybersecurity, maybe there's a transferable skill set at your security company. Maybe there's somebody in the security company that's in cybersecurity. So you can make what we call kind of a lateral move in one company and then eventually get enough cybersecurity experience to go to a different company. So I always tell my clients, you know, try to make it a lateral move. A lot of times I get clients, like I get a handful of lawyers. I get a lot of lawyers that hate their job. They don't want to be a lawyer. They want to be an architect or they want to be an astronomer or they want to do archeology. span And I go, well, that's just the letter A and you want to do something different, but you're not sure what, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. A handful of my Lizisms. let's not get rid of it, but what part of that legal lawyer job do you still like? And maybe we can do a little bit more of what you like and a little less of what you don't like, and then try to make a pivot as you make things better where you are. So I always you know, tell my clients, think outside the box, but, but try to connect the dots to help somebody see where it is you wanna go. I like that transition from lawyer to astronomer. That's that's a fantastic transition. I would like to meet that person and have them on the, as a work ready event. Just interview them about the about that that exciting transition. I I did have a client who came to me and said that he said I want to be an archaeologist, astronomy, or an architect. So we explored all three. Those are all. What, what did he decide? He decided that he wanted to do archaeology, and he moved to Mexico, and he worked on a few digs. And he used his legal connections that he could help them get plans and um, get access to different parts of where he wanted to do the archaeological dig. So he was very conniving in taking his legal experience to an archaeology firm that could benefit from his his knowledge. So he had some great stories and, and really enjoyed it and then came back to Los Angeles a couple of years later and said, OK, I'm done with that. Now I want to be an architect. So he was a great client because I worked with him through two or three job changes, which is not uncommon. For people to make a change and in 2021 and with the generation of young people we're going to see more and more of that gone are the days of working at the same company for 25 years to get the gold watch we're now seeing people actually change jobs more frequently and some of them are freelance they've never had a day job they've always been independent so we need to start thinking a little bit outside the box about what the world of work is like these days yeah these are great questions. So here's a question that brings together a few questions. Um, can you give any tips on how to apply to different kind of jobs online, or are there any specific tips for applying, say, to be uh, to work in a cafeteria of a community college, or you know, some other field? Is there is there, are there differences in applying online to different fields? Well, the biggest thing you've just asked is applying online. And the challenge I have with applying online is that it goes into the black hole and some of these applications online are never to be heard from again. And so it has to be very, very specific that you make it clear that you're not just hitting send, 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 send on 100 different jobs without really taking the time to think about the back door. Think about. Do I have any networking connections to this company? Do I know somebody who's already working at the cafeteria? Because just statistically, you've got like a one in a hundred chance of getting a job online if you apply cold. One in a hundred. You'd have to apply to a hundred jobs to get one to respond. And I bet there's some people in the chat that can admit that they've already applied to a hundred jobs and never heard anything back. So the paradigm shift is to use online as research, use online to find out about the jobs, but then dig a little deeper and use LinkedIn or Facebook to find out about the people that are going to be the hiring manager or the people that are going to be the boss or the people that are the decision makers. 
and then submit maybe an, an, an email to them that or a cover letter that says, Dear Jane Smith, I am very interested in working in the cafeteria at this university. I graduated from this university. I love cafeterias. I love eating. I love cooking. I love this. And I'm curious if you need help because I have this much restaurant experience or I have this experience or I have that experience and I'm interested in learning more about the opportunity. Because when you apply that way, you're using the hidden job market. You're going in the back door. And when you use the hidden job market, your odds of getting hired go from one in 100 to one in 10 because you've made a personal connection and a personal offer to help them. So I was going to ask you about the hidden job market, Liz. I knew I knew this was coming, and I, I was I was thinking actually two questions ago. I was like, I need to ask her about the hidden job market because it's a thing. Tell us about the hidden job market. The Since hidden job market. Now. Yeah, it really is a thing, and it's a thing from both sides. So really, really high class restaurants, high class stores, those fancy shops that everybody wants to work for, they don't advertise. That's the hidden job market. If I was to ask everybody in the audience, like, have you ever gotten a job without a resume? Have you ever gotten a job through a friend or a relative, your mother, who somebody set you up? I would bet we would have a lot of hands going up. A lot of people would say, oh, yeah, I got my job from my, my professor or I got my job from my best friend or my neighbor or my family member. The hidden job market is that they're not published. There's never a promotion or an opening. All that all there was was a help wanted stuck in the window of the local uh, shopping mall or the grocery store or, you know, nowadays there's restaurants and, and um, retail places that are doing their own little job fair. They're basically saying, if you shop at our store, you're going to see the sign, but it's a little bit of a hidden job market because they're not posting it. It's not showing up online. It's not on the World Wide Web. It's not on the Internet. So keeping your eyes open for that hidden job market means that you're going in the back door and you're approaching a company and you're offering to help maybe even before they realize they need the help. So you're actually writing your own job description and telling them, here's what I can do for you. Here's how I can help you. So that hidden job market is about being courageous and putting yourself out there and being curious and offering the help. So let's talk about being courageous. Um, we had a question that I think will resonate with a lot of people. A lot of people are afraid. They're, they ha either they haven't worked for a long time or they had a bad experience recently and were let go and just have a sense of sort of fear and foreboding about returning to the workforce. Can you give us some tips about pe helping people overcome that fear? Absolutely. It's a big thing that I coach my clients on is their confidence and getting their self-esteem up. And so one of the things I coach my clients to do is to really just start to get it out of their head of what they do well. So start with what you're good at and maybe start a journal. I'm a big fan of writing things down. So if you speak a second language, if you can read and write in a second language, if you can play a sport, you know, all of those good things that you can do show your enthusiasm and your excitement and then you start thinking about all the different people you could help, whether it's tutoring somebody or teaching somebody something else, or who is it that you can help? And you start to boost your confidence. And another thing I coach my clients to do is maybe start as a volunteer. Find an organization that you feel fondly about, whether it's your church, whether it's your kid's school, somewhere where you have an opportunity to give back. Because when you're helping somebody else, they benefit and you benefit because you start feeling better about what you can do. And that can also be put on your resume as experience, that you're working at the Red Cross, or you're working as a COVID inspector, or you're working as a crossing guard at your kid's middle school. Whatever we can do to get you out of the house and giving back, whether you're feeding the, I coached a client who was doing a lot of food delivery during COVID. And you know what he really wanted to do was get a job making beer as a as a brewery guy but because the breweries weren't open nothing was happening he realized he knew a little bit about distribution and he knew a little bit about giving back and so he went to his local church and he asked his priest you know where do you send people who need food and they hooked him up with the food bank and so that experience at the food bank kind of built his confidence and he got a reference out of it because the 
boss that was there with him as a volunteer said, you know, you're really good at this. If you can work this well here, you can probably work this well somewhere else. So a big confidence boost is to just start doing something. And there's even virtual opportunities to volunteer. So think about, you know, where you want to give back. Think about what you want to do that makes you happy or healthy or stronger. So, you know, whatever that means, whether you need to go outside and go for a walk every single day or take care of the neighbor's dog or do something that makes you feel good, because when you're feeling good, you're going to bring your better self to the world. Those are just Absolutely. a couple of quick tips. Journaling, I, walking and connecting with other people, offering to help. All 100%. So let's actually, I think this, this question, this next question may have a combination of all of the answers um, and which is great. Um, and we, ha we have a lot of people that are coming to the work ready programs who are older adults. And we also have some who are, you know, basically entering the work world after college, like recent college graduates. Um, I think we even have some high school students and people who work with high school students and college graduates who are here. So what resume advice do you have for recent college grads without internship experience? Now I'm gonna I'm gonna say what resume advice you have, but I'm I wanna also expand that to how can somebody who's just leaving college or high school um, use the hidden job market? So it's actually two questions. And it's a, and it's a lot of questions kind of tied in because I break it down into three phases. So in looking for a career and a career change, phase one is to look inside, and that's all about you. So taking the time to really inventory what are my skills, what am I good at, what do I tangibly know how to do, what are my interests, what do I like to do. What's my knowledge? Maybe I know what my mom's job is. I know what my dad's job is. And then what is my personality? What's a good fit for me? Am I an extrovert and I want to work with people or am I a little bit more introverted? So phase one is figuring out who you are so that you can answer the question. So tell me about yourself. What do you like to do? What do you know how to do? What do you trust that you can do? And taking some time to really figure that out is phase one. Once you figure that out as a recent college grad, it might be what were your favorite academic classes? What projects did you do at school? What research have you done? What did you do for summer vacations? Did you do any, any, any special projects or anything around the house? Maybe for a family member, you helped them out, planned a birthday party or did something. So you can kind of find experiences that are gonna give you what we call success stories. And the more success stories you can come up with, the better you'll be able to answer the questions so tell me about yourself. Once we figure that out, then you can go to what I call phase two, which is research. And this is where the internet can come in really, really helpful. And the library is even more helpful is who's out there in the world doing the kind of work I wanna do. If I played sports and I'm really good at sports, phase two is who's out there in the world that might need somebody with that knowledge and experience about sports. And that's phase two is to do the research. And then phase three is the marketing. Phase three is when you put together your experience and what the world of work needs and you start to write the resume. So you make the resume and your marketing materials, your cover letter fit whatever that job is. So it's kind of a phase one, phase two and phase three. And if you're interviewing somewhere, they know you're a recent college grad. So they're not expecting you to have a beautiful resume, but they are expecting you to have a few success stories where you can connect the dots with, I did this, this, and this in school, and it taught me this, this, and this, and now I want to apply it to the world of work. So you've got to connect the dots for people. Great question. So we, have, we haven't had many questions today about interviews. And I just want, I wanted to ask, uh, interviews require a lot of different skills, but how about, you know, how about if somebody does research and prepares themselves and then they're in that chair looking at the interviewers and they're just frozen. I mean, they're getting asked questions and it's like, just, like how do you <laughs> prepare for that moment where you're sitting in front of three people um, and it feels like a shooting gallery? You know, that is a great question because one of my simple answers is 
practice, practice, practice. I do Zoom calls with my family and I say to them, how do I look? Because I have to practice my Zoom calls with my family and the lighting and everything like that because the real thing is going to come up. And so I was not an expert at Zoom until COVID hit and I had to just practice, practice, practice. Sometimes I practice in front of the mirror. If I'm gonna give a presentation, I'll look in the mirror and I'll roll my shoulders back and do a power stance and kind of pump myself up and go, I can do this. Like, just like that, Oleg, you know, I can do this. And if they've invited you to the interview, they want you. They're just as desperate. They're just as nervous. They don't know, they just know they need help. And they- you know, Liz, I'm gonna interrupt you because because you just said something that's that's so true. Um, I've interviewed people and sometimes before the person comes in, me and the other interviewers, we also feel nervous because we really want that person to be great. We want the person to be so good. Um, and we don't know, you know, we don't know who we're gonna get. So it's it's true. I just wait that that's that's a really good point. And yeah. many people don't think about that. I know. And we really do need to think about that because we kind of even the playing field when we start to think about the fact that they're desperate to hire the right person. And sometimes when you go on an interview, you realize within the first two or three minutes of the interview, this is not what I want to do. This is not the job for me. And that's why I always coach my clients to really try to understand the million dollar question. What exactly are they looking for? In addition to what exactly are you looking for? So that when you get to the interview, you can ask some of those important questions and figure out whether it's a good fit or not. But going into an interview as prepared, done the research, um, even researching the people you're gonna interview, see if you can Google the person, find out an article about them or look, up, look them up on LinkedIn and where did they go to school, be prepared. Is it, what is that, a Boy Scout motto, be prepared? Yeah. So we're, we're living in a society where you can Google and find out as much as you can about the company, the industry, you know, show up ready to, ready to learn. And if they throw crazy wild questions at you, you can be honest and say, honestly, that's a really wild, crazy question. And I'm not sure, but I'll find out. And then after the interview, do some homework, do some research, and maybe write them a cover letter. You asked me this difficult question. I wasn't sure about it. I talked to two or three people. I went to the library. I researched it online. Here's how I would have answered. I was nervous. I didn't, I, I was caught off guard. You know, I'm not exactly sure, but this is what I'm thinking now. And sometimes you'll get a second interview because they'll say, you know what? Let's bring this person back in again. The other thing I say is practice. Practice with relatives, practice with friends, you know, practice answering those challenging questions. One of the most challenging questions many of my clients aren't ready for is, why should we hire you? Why do you want to work here? Oh, it's a job. I need money. Not a good answer. <laughs> yeah. You got to have something a little better than uh, it's a job. Why do you want the job is going to be really, really important because they want to want this the job. job. Yeah. Why do you want this job at this company? Yeah. So be prepared by doing your research. Practice, practice, practice. As, as a person who used to do Toastmasters, um, I practice. And I, I, a lot of people, when they when they practice, they're just staring at their resume or like if you're practicing for doing public speaking, a lot of people are just staring at their paper. They wrote their speech and they're they're walking around with that paper in the office. They're walking around with that paper at home. You have to actually speak. Right. Uh, if, if you don't have people around um, to help you practice, practice in your just practice in your car. I practice speeches in my car when I'm driving. Oh, and uh, you can and tape record them. You can actually yeah. tape record on your cell phone. You can tape record yourself answering a question and then play it back and see how mm -hmm. it sounds. And and you might have to put in the chat about Toastmasters, Oleg, because oh, Toastmasters recommend two thumbs up, three two thumbs, thumbs up, up, four yeah. four thumbs up. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It, it's free. It you know you can well it's free to visit can. a meeting. That's true. You can pay if you want to do the program and you want to go through the motions of learning, you know, public speaking sp skills. But there's some great, and I always tell my clients, don't just go to one Toastmasters meeting, pick three different Toastmasters and go different locations, different See days. which club week. is right for you. Yeah. Find your fit. Find the people mm -hmm. that are going to be supportive and helpful. Yes. Another question about interviews, and this is, this is, this is I think, one that a lot of people have. Uh, how do you talk, when they ask you the question, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? 
How do you talk about your weaknesses? Oh, that's a great question. So here's a, a sneaky trick answer on this. Many of us, whatever our strength is, if you think about it, too much of that strength can become a weakness. For example, one of my strengths is my think outside the box spontaneity and creativity. Why that might be a weakness is if I get a little too spontaneity, spontaneous and I start going off the cuff and then I forget where I am and I forget what I've said. So one thing that I like to do is I like to write things down and I like to be prepared so that I can be spontaneous. Uh, another one of my Lizisms that I, I got from um, my husband is, you know, improvisation is fine as long as you write it down first. So my strength is I can shoot from the hip and answer all these questions that Oleg is, is giving me without a lot of like notes beside me because I've been doing it for 20 years. But my weakness is that I may go off on a tangent and not remember what I'm talking about. So think about what some of your strengths are and then potentially you could find a weakness in them if you had too much of it. In other words, too much of a good thing. So that's a, that's a sneaky way to think about it. But you also want to be able to respond with what you're doing about that weakness and how you're trying to get better at it. So if you're, uh, if public speaking is a weakness, maybe what you try to do is, you know, join a Toastmasters. So always try to frame it with this is a strength that potentially is a weakness and here's what I'm doing about it. Yeah. So it's, it's also, you put it in the form of a story because you're, you're, you have sort of a progression, which is, which is always interesting to listen to and and you're doing something yeah and i'm a huge fan of stories and i tell my clients to write what i call success stories and so uh, and anybody on this call if you'd like a little bit of help writing a success story please email me or connect with me on linkedin because i have a handout on how to write a success story and it's really important that you get it out of your head because a lot of the times we're good at something but because we're good at it and we love to do it we're not so good about explaining it. For example, if you've ever gotten an award or a certificate, or maybe you were, um, you know, you, you got salesman of the year and somebody says, well, how did you do that? And you go, well, I just worked hard. Well, you know, can you tell me something more? Like what, what made you salesman of the year? Well, I made, you know, 25 phone calls a day and I went out on 10 sales calls and I did proposal writing. You know, that's how I have to pull out these success stories is to really get them top of mind so that you can answer the question. So tell me about yourself with an example, with a success story. So stories are very, very important when you're trying to figure out what you want to do next. You can go back to some of your success stories. And when you're moving forward into something and they ask you, well, have you ever had this situation in the past? You've got to have a story file in your head where you go, oh yeah, that happened here. Or that's an example I can use that story for. So I'm a big fan of making your success stories top of mind. So I've got some good tools to help clients with that. And I just posted your contact information in the chat, and it'll be on the slide at the end of the, uh, at the end of our evening today. We're getting close to the end. We have a few more questions. Um, so here's a question about a big question about career planning. Um, now this this is a pretty specific situation, but I think it's also general because it's a it's an important, you know, this person is, is at a decision point that I think a lot of people can resonate with. And so I'm going to read her question in full, and then I think we can kind of generally um, chip away at it and, and give her and everybody else something useful here. So the question is, I had a medical situation that took me out of the workforce for a few years. I actually got accepted to medical school, but could not go due to the medical situation. It's been several years now since I've been in school or working. What advice would you have for people like me who would like to go back to medical school or just apply for a job? I mean, medical school or apply for a job? Uh, what advice do you have for making that decision? Um, and, and how can networking help in that situation? Ooh, you're right, Oleg. You picked a big one. <laughs> We'll try to unpack that because certainly what I like to coach my clients is to get on the road to where you want to be. So I would recommend if this person's not worked for quite a long time, they may need to do what I call a taxi job, which is not driving Uber or Lyft. A taxi job is a job that's going to get them on the road to where they want to be. So a volunteer job at a hospital or a part-time job 
at a hospital, or if they've personally been through a whole lot of medical issues, they probably know a lot of doctors, a lot of nurses, a lot of clinics. Reach out to those doctors and nurses and clinics and maybe offer to help in some of those situations where they know each other. And you can offer to help on a part time basis just to get your foot in the door, maybe offer to work 1 day a week or maybe 2 days a week. And if you're torn between, should I go to school and, or should I get a job? Remember that for any of you out there, if you're kind of sort of thinking, maybe I'll go back to school. Ask yourself if you're going back and not really going forward. Because remember, when you go to a school, the 1st person you're likely to get in touch with. Is going to be somebody in an office called what? Admissions. And what's the office of admissions responsible? What are they responsible for? Their job is to admit you. But the curiosity is you want to go to what I call the end of the school program to placements. Where do people that graduate in that program get placed? If you go to that medical school, what does the end look like? Does that look like residency? Does that look like internship? Does that look like seven years and $250,000 or more? Begin with the end in mind with where you want to be and then ask yourself, is that where I want to be at the end and where do I want to be at the beginning? Because you've got a big decision to make. Should I go back to school in order to go forward? And I'll tell you a story about a client I was working with who I, I saw her in one of my workshops. She came for the first couple of days and then she dropped out. I didn't see her again. And then about a year later, I started a new series of workshops and she showed up again. And I said, wait a minute, didn't I see you in this program a while ago? And she said, oh yeah, I was in this program and I was unemployed, I was out of work, I needed help. And so I got a government grant to go to school and I talked to a case manager, an admissions counselor, and this counselor said, you know, what's your experience? And she said, I didn't have any experience except taking care of kids and taking care of my family. I, I like to help people. So she suggested I go to nursing school. And I said, well, great. Did you go to nursing school? And she said, sure, I went to nursing school. I went for nine months. I got my CNA, certified nursing assistant. I got my certificate. And I said, well, great. Then what about the job? She said, I couldn't get a job. I said, why not? She goes, well, I didn't have any work experience. All I had was a certificate. And I said, well, what did you do? And she goes, well, the school placed me in an internship, unpaid externship, internship, and she worked at the hospital. I said, great, so you're working at the hospital. She goes, oh no, I hate it. All those sick people, I have to change bedpans. I, I, I couldn't stand the smell. I had to wear a uniform. I hated my job as a nurse. Oh man. And, and the lesson there is I asked her, had you ever like worked in a hospital or been a patient in a hospital? And she was like, well, no, I, I you know, I, I didn't spend a lot of time in hospitals. And so my, my lesson from that is be careful what you go for, for you will surely get it. Now, if, if this young lady had spent a day shadowing a doctor or a day shadowing a nurse, do you think she ever would have gone to nursing school? She hated blood. She hated sick people. She didn't want to wear a uniform. It smells in there. It's a dangerous place to be in a hospital. You can you can you can get your own self sick being in a hospital. So ask yourself, what where should I go before I start to go down this long path in making this decision? And is the end result what I really want it to be? So that's a tough one for anybody who's thinking I'm going to go back to school. My curiosity is go to the placement office at the school and, and take a look at what that job's like at the end. That's a, that's one suggestion for that for that person that's out there. Well, that's a lot. That was an me. excruciating story, Liz. Yes. I, I put myself in the place of this person going going to be a nurse. Yeah. Wow. And I have lots of those stories. I could tell one more. I had a guy that was laid off. He was kind of a construction guy and he got laid off and um, he went and he got a certificate to do cable installation. And it was a six month program and he got the cable installation certificate. Well, part of the graduation program was they took all of the students and they took them out on a field test to pass the field test. He had to climb up a, I don't know, 30 or 40 foot telephone pole. And he took one look at that telephone pole. And he said, I can't do that. I'm afraid of heights. Well, if he had seen the end of cable installation 
and knew that he would be climbing underneath houses and climbing up telephone poles, would he have gone to school for six months? Probably not. So there's a handful of these stories where I go, whose choice is it where you go to work? Is it your mom or dad? No, it's yours. It's yours. Exactly. So be careful. Another Lizism. Be careful what you go for. Yes. So I have a I have an interview question. I have another interview question. Actually, it's a it's a post interview question. Uh, and the question is, what's a reasonable amount of time to wait for a company to get back to you? Is there a range, or does it matter about the industry? You know, what what, what do you think? That, that's that's a great question, and I am a huge fan of persistence, but patient persistence. And yet you want to be the squeaky wheel. You want to be the candidate that says, I'm very interested, and I'm following up to see if you uh, if you need any additional information from me. You can even use opportunities to reach out with things like, you know, here's a couple suggestions on references you might want to check on my behalf. Or I forgot to mention in the interview how interested I am in X, Y, Z. Or I was I did the interview last week. I wrote the thank you note. Maybe you look for an article related to that company or an article related to that industry, and you use sending that article as an opportunity to reach out. Hey, I, I know it's been a little while since I've talked to you. I think the rule of thumb is a week. If you haven't heard back from somebody in a week, if they're human resources or a hiring manager, you might even just say to them, you know, it's been a few days since I've heard from you. I'm just curious if you need any more information from me. Is there anything I can do to clarify? And then reiterate, your cover letter is a writing sample. So make sure a friend or a family member proofreads it for you before you send it, because they'll put it in the file. And most people don't take the time and energy to write the cover letter, to write the thank you note, to write the follow-up letter. And yet a company, when they've got five applicants and five of them go to the interview, but only four write a thank you note, and then a week and a half goes by and only three follow up, and then another week goes by and only two follow up, it's those squeaky wheels that are going to get that connection. And sometimes you're going to be ghosted. That's a, a buzzword for you may never hear back from them, but you can also follow up. Sometimes I tell a client, if you applied for a job, maybe you went on one interview, two interviews, three interviews, and they didn't hire you. Maybe they went with somebody else. Guess what? Follow up in a couple months. Follow up in three months. Hey, I thought we had a connection. I know you went ahead and hired somebody else. Because statistically, most people will quit or get fired in the first three months. So you want to be there ready to get back in. I've had people, you know, get turned down. I had a client get turned down for a job. He was devastated. He thought it was a great job. He, you know, he wrote a note that said, I understand you went in another direction. I just want you to know that I'm very passionate about this. So if another opportunity comes up, please keep me in mind. And sure enough, 10 days later, they called him back and they said, guess what? The guy that we offered the job to got offered another job and took off. So guess what? You're our second choice, but now you're getting offered the job. So now you're the first choice. Now you're the first choice. This is a, it's a really good advice. Just sort of polite, a courteous follow up. It doesn't take very much. It's, there's no risk involved right. because, you know, the HR people get emails all day long. Um, so you're not, it's, it's not like you're bothering them or anything because you're not sending rude emails. Right. Um, and you're basically offering to help. I know you guys need to fill this position. Maybe I can come on on a part time basis. Maybe I can come on as a consultant. You, sometimes you can get a bit creative. In offering to help. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we're, let me see what we, if we have any other questions. I just put a last call in a few minutes ago. I'm going to see if we have anything left because I do have another question that I didn't see that I, I think I saw somewhere in there and I wanted to give you a chance to talk about it because it's important. And since we've been with you here for the last hour and 15 minutes, I think there are people out there who would be interested in knowing about this. I'm, I'm creating a lot of suspense around this question. It's not a very suspenseful question. Um, it, the question is, I, I, I remember somebody posting it in, in the Q&A a little while ago. The question is, how do you work with your clients? You know, how do you, when you get an inbound client, like what's the process? Do you meet with people weekly? Do you meet with people? You know, I'm interested in the job of a career coach. That's a great question. Oh my gosh. So I think I have the most wonderful job because 
I really do get to work with a variety of people. And I am of the opinion that if you really, 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 really want a job, I can help you get it. Whether you're a lawyer looking for a new law practice, whether you're a recent college grad, whether you're an executive who's in transition, I love the job of a coach because we work together. And coaching is a little different than counseling. It's not therapy, although I have a master's degree in counseling and I do a lot of therapy. Coaching for careers is I'm helping you figure out who you are. And so a lot of the work that I do with clients is pulling out of them what is inside their heads. Really, I, some, I call it a career checkup. And I've had some of my clients say, oh, this is like going to the dentist because you're pulling teeth. And I say to them, I'm looking for the gold nuggets. Like, why did you do what you did? Why did you study what you did? What is it that gets you up in the morning? What are you passionate about? And some of my clients are like, I don't know. And so I have tools that I use. I use um, assessment tools. I use a lot of values-based goal setting. I use a little bit of, of Q&A. I usually take on clients um, on a three-month package because it takes about three months to change behavior. It also takes about three months to kind of break through all three of those phases from career exploration in the middle to the first phase, which is all about you. What are your core values? Because our values change over our lifetime. What are you interested in? What are your skills? And then that third phase, which includes LinkedIn and, and interviewing and applications and salary negotiation. So it's a series of conversations. And most of the conversations are 45 minutes to an hour. I like to do them on Zoom because I like to see people, but I also just kind of get people on the telephone. And we work it out so that it's a win-win. Some of my clients are working full time, so I have to do evening sessions. Some of my clients are not working and they're really eager to get started, so we work more quickly and we can do a weekly session for three or four weeks. Other clients want to take their time and we talk every other week. So it's kind of a, it's, it's custom. I don't have a cookie cutter program because as I said, there's no two people alike and there's no two jobs alike. So I take things on as a process, take it on as a project to work together. Sounds good. And so let me put up this slide here. Oh, well, okay. We, we just got another question and I want to ask, you're here. I want to ask you this question. I think other people might be interested. How do you negotiate salary? Ah, I love negotiating salary. I'm a huge fan of salary negotiation because you don't get what you don't ask for. And I coach my clients to really clearly understand what the job is requiring and then really understand how they can match that up. They're looking for a high level manager, you've got management experience. They want somebody that can deliver the product, you can deliver the product. And you highlight all of the different things that they're looking for. And then you do your research. Maybe you look at other companies, other um, similar positions, you find out what that salary is, and then you push the envelope to see whether they're willing to step up. And salary negotiation might not even be about the salary. It may be about vacation time. It may be about working from home versus going into the office. It may be about a title that you want to have because you want to have that for career development. Maybe you want to negotiate. So negotiation is about figuring out what they need and figuring out what you want and then conveying it that it's a really good fit to come together. And it's always fun when clients get really nervous with me and they're like, well, how can I negotiate? I, I'm a recent college grad and they're offering me $75,000 a year. That's a lot of money. Why would I ask for more? And I go, well, let's talk about that. You were, a, you know, you had a 3.5 GPA from a great university. You've got, you know, sports and team building experience. So, you know, let's go ahead and think about what that's worth. And, and we rehearse it and we practice it. And we make sure that they've con convinced themselves that it's worth asking for because you have to believe it yourself, but it's also worth pulling out of you what you bring to the table. That is what they need because there's a lot of jobs out there that are difficult and challenging and hard. And I want you to be compensated, especially women. I don't think women do as much salary negotiation as they should. And statistically, we as women are still paid substantially less than most men out there. So I always want to boost the confidence of the women and say, ask for it. And I have one success story from that where a woman had, was applying online. Um, she'd networked in her community and she saw a job online that she was really intrigued about. 
And she, she went through a process that I taught her and we worked together and she got the interview. She got offered the job and she was told that 20 people were going to be onboarded at the same time. And she said to me, you know, Liz, maybe I should negotiate for a higher starting salary. And I said, absolutely. It's easier to negotiate a higher salary before you start the job rather than afterwards. And she was nervous about it. We coached around it a lot. We talked about it a lot and she requested it. And she said she got denied, but she wrote me back and she said, not only did I get denied, but the woman, the HR person who denied me said, you're one of only two people who asked for more money. So we're gonna put your name on a list because we hope that we will be able to offer people a little bit more, more money further on. But since you're one of two out of 20 that asked for it, we think highly enough about you because we want you to, we want your type of person with the confidence to go forward. And so we will reevaluate in 90 days and let you know if we can give you a promotion. So she felt great about that. I also had a high school, not a high school, I had a college student who took a job and they wanted him to start the Monday after he graduated on Saturday. And he said to me, Liz, all my friends are going to go out of town. They're going to travel. I can't graduate on a Saturday and start work on a Monday. And I said, well, you need to tell them that. And he was like, but I can't negotiate my start date. And I said, what would it be like if you could? And he said, that would be like hitting a home run at the baseball game. And I said, all right, well, then here's what we're going to do. We're going to give them all the reasons why you're great and you want the job and you want to start, but you can't start Monday. You want to start the following Monday. And we're going to, we're going to lay it all out. And then at the end, you're going to say, but I understand if this is a deal breaker, I understand I won't go on the vacation because I really do want this job. And we practiced and we rehearsed and he made the phone call and he texted me back and he said, home run. Guess what? I'm starting two weeks later. So it's a win-win situation. They want you to be happy. They're just as nervous as Oleg and I were saying. They're just as nervous about hiring the right person. They want you happy at that job and you want to be happy at that job. So don't, don't, don't deny yourself the opportunity to practice and figure out how to do a negotiation when you get the chance. That's a great one. Okay, okay. last question. So do you think they would give the job to someone who does negotiate a salary versus somebody who does not? Well, the, you don't negotiate the salary until you've been offered the job. So you're going to get the job, whether you negotiate the salary or you don't negotiate the salary. They're not going to say, oh, that person asked for too much money. We're not going to give them the job. A lot of people have that fear. And what I say to them is they want you. They've offered you the job. All you're doing is showing confidence an initiative and your ability to communicate that you would be really happy if you could get a little bit of something more. So don't have that fear of, oh, I'm going to offend them. It is a confidence thing. And I don't, I don't coach every client to do it this way, but I coach my clients to really sort of understand that we're trying to make this a win-win situation. They need the help. You've got the help to offer. Let's see how we can work together so that you, you make the offer the best you can make it. Sounds great. Yeah. So let me put up your slide here with your contact information, Liz, because I want people to be able to contact you if they need to. And I know I put the LinkedIn right on top here because I know that you want people to connect with you on LinkedIn. I love that. And LinkedIn has almost made resumes obsolete. So if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you probably want to go back to one of Oleg's workshops on how to do a LinkedIn because- And Sylvia did that, did that workshop. Yes, yes. So it's it's not for everybody. It's not for every industry, but you kind of want to be familiar with it because especially with COVID where we're not quite outside yet, we're still kind of virtual. People are going to wonder who you are and they're going to Google you. So you've got to be careful about what shows up on your social media because if you're looking for work, what you see is what you get. So I love LinkedIn. Connect with me on LinkedIn and let me know a little bit about who you are and let me know if I can help you. Thanks, Liz. This this was really fun. I'm glad we did this Q and A program. I mean, we were we were talking about doing it, and uh, since we had never done it before, I wasn't exactly sure how it would turn out. But I'm really glad it did. Me too. Um, well, you you have a great way of pulling questions together because there's there's so many different directions it can go, and yet I think it was helpful to have a combination of questions put together. So thank you, Oleg. And with that, once again, thank you, Liz for your generosity in thank answering you. all of our questions. Oh, thank, thank you, Thank you, Anna, Anna Sylvia.
This is always fun for sure. me because I don't have to do any PowerPoints. I can just get on like a radio talk show and answer questions because I really do believe that there's a job for everybody out there. It's just a matter of figuring it out and getting on the right path. So I hope that everybody walked away with some nuggets of wisdom and some new ideas. And I just want to thank everybody for taking time out of their day to attend and listen in and learn. So thank you again, Oleg. Absolutely, and thank you, Anna Sylvia, for moderating the program today, moderating all of our work ready programs. And with that, I appreciate you all being here, and I will see you next week. All right, bye bye.